Okay, great. Um, my name's Harry Allo. I'm As Lizzie introduced, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Greenwich. Um, I'm teaching EAP at the University of Westminster, and I taught in London and Italy and such. Um, today I'm going to be talking about processing instruction. I'm going to be referring a lot to Bill Van Patten, who's the guru of processing instruction. Um, right from 1993, still continuously very prominent in today's research of second language acquisition. Okay, um, this session might be a little bit different than what a Teaching House Presents is used to. Um, I'm going to be looking at a bit more theory and the gap between theory and practice. Um, I'm not here to tell you how to teach or whether to teach an easygoing activity or how to plan a lesson in two minutes, but rather I want you to think about how what I'm talking about can be implemented in your classroom and how it can affect your teaching. Okay? Um, I'm going to start with what happens in your classroom and a few definitions that you might think that you have an idea from, but I'm going to suggest other definitions for these. Um, I'm going to look at what language learners do when they're exposed to language. Then we're going to look at how you can facilitate language acquisition and maybe have a rethink about what might happen in your classroom. So, to start, um, a minute with the people you're sitting with. What currently happens in your language classroom? Okay, with the person next to you, with the threes or behind you. What happens in your language classroom? Okay, so I heard, I heard some things. Um, I heard practicing, interaction, communication, practicing tasks, doing tasks. I heard these sorts of things, and I think people would agree these are the types of things that we generally do in our language classroom. Okay, I want you to have a look at this task. This task is from an ELT website, and I'm sure um, modern foreign language teachers also do this sort of task. I'm really sorry it's not very big. Okay, so it's a simple... Last year, I went to England on holiday, um, changing the verb to the past simple. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with this activity? What might be wrong with this activity? Ideas. Let's have a think. Nothing's incorrect. It's a bit dull. Okay, it's a bit dull, yeah. Uh, rather grammatically schematic. Okay, good, yeah. It's quite a bit panel, because you don't have to choose the tense. Lovely, yeah, good. So I put nonsense words in here. And students can still do this task. Okay? So last year I went to England on plot. Um, I visited lots of cognomant places. You can even change the verb, and if the student assumes that this is a regular past tense, they'd say, in the mornings we clopped in the streets of London. Okay? <laughs> what does this suggest about this activity? That we can put nonsense, wor nonsense words in there, but it still works. What does it suggest? What do we think? Lovely. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So this suggests that learners that are using this type of activity are producing language-like behavior rather than language. Okay. Therefore, the activity that requires practice is not actually looking at communication and the development of language in the learner's mind brain, but rather this robotic language-like behavior. Okay. Research has shown, Van Patten suggests, that um, practice like this does not produce language in the brain. It doesn't produce a developed language system in the brain. Okay, so a few more definitions. The difference between language-like behavior and language. What is language? So we're, we're all language teachers, but can anyone think to themselves what a working definition of language is? I want you to raise your hand if you can give me a concrete working definition of language. Okay, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to hear. That's good, though. <laughs> no, no, let me. But just, just one of us has a very good idea of the concrete working definition of language. Okay, this might tell us something. So this is what Van Patten suggests. He suggests that language is an implicit mental representation that is abstract and complex. Okay. Sorry, I'm in the way. Okay, so when we say that it's implicit, um, I'm going to give you an example of this. I want you to tell me whether this, you can say, whether you can say this. Yeah, we can say this. Can you say this one? 
Should I have done it? Okay, can anyone tell me why you can't say this one? Okay, but is that... Mm, okay. This is an example of language being this implicit thing in our heads that we know that you can say, I've done it, that's fine, and it sounds good, but I, should I've done it? Suddenly it, sound, it sounds wrong, and we can't really put our finger on why. Van Patten gives many more examples about this throughout the literature. For example, the difference between singular and plural. Uh, for example, every person is entitled to their opinion is fine. That works. Agreed? Yeah. All people are entitled to his opinion sounds wrong. Okay? This is this idea that we cannot express in certain, in certain circumstances the language that is implicit on our head. This is the difference between language-like behavior and language. Okay? Um, so we're saying that language is not built from practice and skill knowledge, but what is it built from? What do we think it might be built from if it's not built from practice or skill knowledge? The use, okay. Practice, yeah. Van Patten suggests is input. Now, not any type of input. We need to define this. So he suggests that input that is um, in a communicative context. So this is something that's meaning-bearing. So something that <coughs> l learners respond to for meaning. In this context, we need to also define communication. What is communication? Transferring something from my head into your head and we're trying to build the same picture. Right? Okay, good. So we've got two people. It's not a one-way thing. What else? What else do we assume is communication? Else Sorry? Okay. Sorry? Good, yeah, that, that two that two ways. So the expression and interpretation of meaning. Okay, and practice is not a shortcut for communication and not a shortcut for input. Okay, so a learner receives all types of input, whether it's written or spoken, and it's fundamental to language learning. However, why don't learners receive and process developing um, through to their system all of the intake inputs that they are exposed to? What happens here? Okay, this is where this theory comes in. Now, I'm going to try and make it not too theory-based. Um, and I'm going to give you some examples, um, but this, I want you to consistently think how is what I'm saying um, applicable to what you do in class and what your learners do in class. Okay, um, so Van Patten suggests that this picture here is like um, uh, the metaphor in a supermarket. Okay, so the cash register is the learner's mind brain. That's what they, that's the thing inside their head. The red scanner that they use is the input processor. So this part here how it gets from input into their mind brain. And the barcodes on um, all of the products is the input, okay? The input, the li linguistic input. The scanner can only scan the barcodes. It can't see images. It can't see the shape of the products. It can only scan the barcodes. It can only get that linguistic data. And the computer can only receive the data processed via the scanner. It can't read the barcode itself. If you put a barcode in front of a computer, nothing happens. If you put practice expressions in front of a student, nothing really happens. Okay, um, this um, metaphor of the supermarket is how language acquisition works. The way that the brain can only process what has been processed into the correct type of data that then for goes into the system. You can think of it like a CD on a record player. A CD and a record have very similar data. They both have music on them. But when you put a CD on a record player, the record player doesn't read the CD. It's the wrong type of data, the wrong type of input. OK. So why don't learners process everything that they're exposed to? One, they have limited capacities. So we can give them as much data as we want, whether it's input, whether it's comprehensible, meaningful input, or whether it's just complete gobbledygook, they can only process a certain amount. 
their comprehension is effortful in um, cognition and in working memory, but we can get around this and I'll show you some techniques that you can reduce this strain on their cognitive um, processing. We're driven to get meaning when comprehending. Okay? This is this difference between the form practice that we looked at earlier and some of the meaning-based practices that I'll look at in a minute. They also have processing strategies. Okay, this is where it's really important to understand why, how your learners look and receive and process input. Okay, this is really theory heavy, but don't look at this, don't look at this. This is just for those that really like words and are really visual learners as such, okay? Um, these two principles mainly suggest that learners look for meaning before form and that they will process the first noun in the sentence as the subject, okay? I'll give you an example. In this sentence, the learner will process the adverbial of time yesterday instead of the ED of walked. Therefore, if I give a learner um, practice saying, yesterday I go to London, the last week I go to Spain, okay? They will be focusing on that um, lexical item of yesterday last week, okay? Therefore, they, this will um, cloud their processors with all of these lexical items rather than focusing on the grammatical aspect, rather than making that form meaning connection between ED and the meaning of past. Now, this um, principle is um, constrained by many different things, such as non redundancy, um, meaning of grammatical markers, um, lexical preferency, and availability of resources, what's going on in their head. Um, but this is more <laughs> for the, the research heavy. On the other side, the first noun principle is, is quite straightforward and it's something that we're, we're all aware of. So in this sentence, they would um, interpret John as doing the action rather than um, Mary. Okay, we've seen this through continuous research that learners continuously pick up these mistakes. So how can we bridge this gap between this really theory heavy looking at all these principles, understanding, okay, lexical preference, non-redundancy. How can we bridge this with the practice of what teachers do in classes. Okay, so processing instruction is the pedagogical intervention created by Van Patten to avoid these um, problematic strategies that learners use. It's based on that theory of input processing and it's based to alter learners' default processing um, principles and encourage better ones. And I'm gonna show you how you can use this in your class. Um, it's improving the quality of input fundamentally. So these things that the um, um, cognitive weight, the, the weight and um, compression and um, um, fuzziness when they have loads of input can be reduced because of the way we provide input, the way we manipulate input. Okay, um, a quick snippet of my PhD. Um, it's been proved that if you use this type of method, um, say, for example, on the past imperfect in French, learners are able to interpret other, um, other target features with no further instruction. This is proving that they have a cognitive change, and we can see this through various um, online measures such as eye tracking and brain scans. So we will be able to see that learners are better language learners because of the input you provide them and because of the instruction you provide them. Okay. This is to be continued. <laughs> okay, so on to the practical aspect. How can you facilitate this acquisition rather than this language-like robotic behavior? Um, so processing instruction is quite heavy because researchers love to be organized and love to include lots of fancy words, but pretty much we give, them explicit, we give the students explicit information and activities that are specifically structured to um, change those processing strategies. The first thing is explicit information. Now, this is argued with researchers, and it might be argued amongst yourselves. Do you agree with teaching explicit grammar? Do you not? But personally, I see my students, when I say, okay, we're going to do the past perfect, and this is how it works, they think, yeah, okay, past perfect, I'm at that level. They're actually physically excited, and they understand, and they have more, um, less anxiety because they have an understanding of the structure. Okay, this is a part of processing instruction that you can take, you can leave, you can involve, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, what, as I said, what I'm showing to you, I'd like you to pick apart and use it in your own way. 
So um, the first part of processing instruction, this is an example in Italian, is literally the grammar form. Okay, so the, past te the future tense is added um, ero on the end of the uh, root of the verb. Okay. The second part is the interesting part. This part tells the learner what they're going to do wrong before they've done it wrong. So this says to them, okay, when you're looking at the future tense, you might see temporal adverbs. Watch out for these because sometimes you don't have them. So look at the end of the verb instead. Okay, this reduces the fact that they might um, incorrectly process this um, grammatical feature. The structured impact activities are the bit that are, um, are the crux of processing instruction. Okay. Um, these parts ch um, change the processing strategy along with the explicit information, but they force learners to make meaning and form connections. So they cannot just process the grammatical form aimlessly in practice, but they have to understand it and receive meaning from it to understand what the task is asking them to do. Um, so there's a guideline for structured impact activities, which I will give you um, if you want to take away with you, um, which helps you because you can just input the target features into this guideline. It means that it reduces the work on you, <laughs> which means that you can look at the target feature and how learners process instead. So quite clearly, things like pre um, present one thing at a time, this will limit this capacity, uh, limit the um, cap the processing capacity that I talked about earlier. Um, keeping meaning and focus, keeping communicative intent in your classrooms at all time, ensuring learners are actually doing something with the practice that they're using. So, um, an example is a referential um, activity. These require learners to um, get something right or wrong. Okay, They require learners to look at the meaning and the form collectively. So, for example, um, take the sentences that talk about Harriet's childhood. Harriet went to the zoo at the weekend, goes to work every day, reads many books, walks to the bus, watch TV in the evening. Now, okay, I might still go to the zoo every weekend, but um, the learner can't necessarily understand that, that that was my childhood or my adulthood from going to the zoo. They have to understand the, um, the form with the meaning here. This also shows the verb at the initial part of the sentence. One of the other things that we've seen in research is that learners always look at the beginning, at the end, then at the middle. Therefore, if you're teaching something like the um, subjunctive in French or Italian, that's the last thing they look at. Therefore, that's the last thing they process because their processing load is on all the other um, items that they've just looked at. Therefore, when we're setting up these activities to put um, the target feature in the first, in the initial position of what you're doing, means that the learners are consistently looking at this. We then have effective activities, which are more like real-world situations. Um, these don't have right or wrong answers, so this affects things like individual differences, anxiety loads in classes. It means that learners can um, constantly be exposed to the target feature that you're looking at, but there's not the pressure to get it right or wrong. An example here, so read the statements below and tick whether you did this as a child. Okay, they have to understand the lexical vocabulary here, but they can still be like, yeah, I went on holiday, I watched um, cartoons, I walked to school. Bear in mind, we still encourage learners to do something with this. So now, check if you have the same answer as your partner. So they're still actually attending to the input and they're still having to understand. If I say, yeah, I walked to school and they say, oh, okay, I got the bus and the learner goes, okay, no, no, I got the bus too. The, they will still have to understand in order to communicate with their partner. Again, that two-way communication. Okay, um, so teachers are not necessarily needed. <laughs> Unfortunately, with the um, internet coming up, we have rules online and we have random practice online. But you have the ability to facilitate cognitive development with structured activities such as this. You can change what's happening in the learner's brain, and we've seen this, which means that you can facilitate that acquisition not only with the grammatical feature that you're looking at, but also with subsequent grammatical features. When they go back home and they sit on the internet and look at practice, they're more able, their brain is primed for these features. Okay, um, so I have this sheet, and I'd like you to have a quick go. So I have two um, grammatical forms on the back. 
And I want you, with your partner, to have a think about what you could do as a referential and affective activity. It's on the front, so if this was all a bit too much and you're all a bit overblown and you think, oh, I'm not going to do this in my class, it's okay, it's still on the front. Okay, so in small groups, I think, yeah, we've got some time. Thank okay, you. shall I do like three? Okay, so there, there is a breakdown of the um, principles that we looked at um, in a bit more coherent language. There you go. So on the back, I want you to choose one of the grammatical aspects, whether it's the third person singular or the passive in English or any other language you want, and have a think about how you could apply, the, apply activities to this. Okay, I'm going to wrap up so then we can have some more cheese and wine. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in this sort of thing, um, Bill Van Patten did write a textbook. It's in French, but you can understand, you can understand the, the meaning of the, the task and what happens in the task. I mean, you can see it's, um, the description's written in English, but the rest is in French, so you can understand how he applies this task in a whole course, not just one third-person singular activity in the class. Um, for, sorry? So I really appreciate you listening. I hope this wasn't too heavy, and I'd really appreciate some feedback. What do you think you would include any of these in your class? Would this change anything that you do in your classes? Does it change the way you look at your learners as yourself, as a facilitator rather than a teacher? So I'm going to leave those thoughts with you. Um, I have reading because I'm, I'm an academic, so I do this sort of thing. Um, this is a really great podcast. Um, Van Patten speaks for an hour every other Thursday about anything in um, language teaching or language acquisition. It's called Tea with BVP, um, and he calls himself the diva of um, second language acquisition. So he's a really cool guy. Um, and th some of the things he talks about is individual differences, communicative language teaching. He talks about how you can use different activities in your class um, and so on. So I really appreciate you listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Yay!